Hi, Alex. Hey, Dan. Uh, all right, so we're ready to do another episode of Blogging Heads. I'm Daniel Strauss, a reporter for Talking Points Memo, and I'm here with Alex Seitzwald of National Journal. And uh, today we're going to talk about a few topics. We're going to uh, hit on basically uh, party infighting within the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. And then we're going to move into the ongoing topic of uh, Obamacare, the rollout, and how it's been portrayed lately. Um, Alex, I really wanted to do this blogging heads with you because I've been a big fan of your work both at National Journal and Salon on uh, sort of the outer reaches of uh, each party and uh, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. And you've covered the fringe and, you know, some of the more eccentric sort of uh, examples of the fringe uh, over the past few years. Um, and most of my reporting so far at TPM has been on uh, political infighting. So mm -hmm. Republicans on Republicans and Democrats on Democrats. And right now, I wanted to, I mean, to start off, I wanted to ask you um, if what's going on with the GOP, from your view, is a so-called uh, GOP civil war, which is something liberals seem to gleefully uh, label uh, Republicans fighting with Republicans, uh, outside groups, uh, battling with the National Republican Senatorial Committee and Mitch McConnell. Um, so I'd love to hear your take on that to uh, start this off and uh, sort of really figure out if we're seeing a civil war on the right and then on the left, too. Yeah, um, well, and I will return the, the kind words and say I'm a big fan of yours, too, as well, from Talking Point to on the Hill before that. Um, yeah, I, I think it is fair to call it a, a, a civil war. I mean, obviously, there's no, you know, no one has <clears throat> taken to muskets and bayonets out at Bull Run yet. Uh, we, we don't see <laughs> Ted Cruz against Ryan's previous. But I, I really do think there is a war on for the, the kind of heart and soul of the Republican Party uh, going forward. You know, if you pull back and look at the multi-decade view, um, I, I think kind of the, the core coalition within the, the Republican Party was big business elites or kind of, you know, country club Republicans and the the social conservative, um, you know, and now libertarian wing, kind of a, you know, um, more rural, uh, not as wealthy, although they do tend to be wealthier than your average people, a little bit older, white, extremely white, um, you know, lacking a college education for a lot of them. So that was kind of like a, a, a base coalition um, that worked very well for the Republican Party for a long time. Ronald Reagan talked about the three stools, you know, national security, uh, Republicans, uh, fiscal kind of Republicans and social conservatives. And those three stools work together. But I think what's happening now is that coalition is no longer large enough to deliver a presidential election. So it's starting to rip apart uh, at the seams to make some metaphors where the stool is starting to wobble. Uh, so mm -hmm. there, there's really a battle going on. You know, is the Republican Party going to be a more, a smaller and more ideological pure uh party moving forward, which is like, you know, the Ted Cruz Tea Party wing, or is it going to be um, a larger thing moving forward? And and you're also, with the rise of the Tea Party libertarian ideology, it, it goes up against some, some of the core interests of these big business elites, um, you know, like using government tax breaks to favor businesses uh, and, and things that have long been taken for granted, but that, you know, real ideological libertarians don't actually favor. They say that's government picking winners and losers, just like what um, liberals like. So, yeah, I absolutely think there's, there's, um, and we could get into it, you know, on a, on a whole host of policy areas from immigration reform, especially is, is kind of one of the more obvious ones to, um, gay marriage, but also, you know, on entitlements, um, on fiscal policy, on a, on a whole host of things. And it's incredible. I'll, I'll just, um, point to some polling here. My colleague, Brian Resnick compiled, um, a, a bunch of, polling on some key questions and, and pollsters have more recently started separate. Well, they've done this for a while, but since the rise of the Tea Party, they've, they've started separating out Tea Party Republicans from non Tea Party Republicans and on almost every major policy area up for debate um, right now, from the size of the budget to, to climate change. If you look at the numbers, you have 
uh, non Tea Party Republicans generally on one side, and you have Tea Party Republicans on the other side. I mean, it's really a stark divide. I was shocked to see how big these differences were. Um, and like one of the key questions that underlies everything is, you know, do you want your members of Congress to compromise or do you want them to stand on their, you know, positions and not compromise? And non Tea Party Republicans say compromise, Tea Party Republicans say don't compromise. Um, so that's that's really like the key friction point from a from a strategy point of view. But obviously that touches like pretty much every policy area. Yeah, I mean, the so the the, the compromise thing, I think it really I, I'm so wary of calling it a civil war because, you know, Republicans I talk to like to say, well, this is what goes on every time the party is out of power and doesn't have the White House. There's introspection sure. and, uh, you know, sort of disagreement and sort of stark divides on where uh, uh, um, the party should, which direction the party should go with. But, you know, what, we, what we're seeing here over the last few months, and especially with the government shutdown, I think, and even, like you said, on battles on, like, immigration, it's, it's, not, it's not a level of coordination or sort of, it doesn't. It, it's it, it's a, a lesser level of coordination than I think you would expect, and that you would see in recent years. And I, I like like you said, I I really. It, it just seems to me like the the real divide, the real threat right now, if you're a Republican, is to have someone point fingers at you and say you're not a Republican or right. you're not a conservative. Um, I I, you know, I over the past few days I've been thinking a lot about. Uh, the Wyoming Senate race between um, Wyoming Republican primary between uh, Liz Cheney and Mike Enzi. Yeah. And, you know, supporters of Cheney uh, like to sort of say that Enzi may be not as conservative as he sort of claims to be or he's known as, but he's a national journal ranks him as like one of the most conservative members of the Senate. Yep. And my real interpretation of like why anyone would want to would see Enzi as less of a conservative would be that he's not like a fire breather. You know, he's not making big speeches. He's not going out there and pointing fingers and yelling and making a big hullabaloo of things. Uh, but, you know, on entitlement reforms, on uh, gay marriage, on abortion, those are all issues that he's really, really conservative on. Um, so I don't really know, like it, it's, I, I <laughs> it's hard to avoid the fact that, uh, there is, there is a definite, definite divide. And I, your point about, uh, sort of even dividing within the Republican party, Tea Party Republicans and, you know, uh, I guess more moderate or mainstream Republicans is, I think, telling. Uh, how does that, I mean, every time I look at polls like that, I always go to the Tea Partiers, uh, just because those numbers indicate to me where the pressure will be. Yeah. It, it seems to me that, like, you know, with the government shutdown, a lot of the GOP didn't really want to go for a uh, shutdown over the defund Obamacare effort, but there was mm -hmm. so much pressure to do it, um, you know, that they had to go in anyway on it. Uh, I recently reported on the Defending Mainstream PAC, which is a, a super PAC that's aiming to sort of uh, nominate and support more uh, mainstream Republicans, and they're not fans of Tea Partiers, and they're a small PAC. They, it's hard for them to go up, or it's going to be hard for them to really compete with the bigger outside groups. Yeah. Um, but I, I like, it's it, it, the fact that these things exist and their like primary goal is really not to defeat Democrats. It's to keep their sort of strict part of the Republican party in power in elected office, uh, is pretty aggressive in its own way, I think. Yeah. And I, and, you know, I think we have to say like, like the tea party has been really successful, at least in the, in the medium term that we have seen their, their existence. Um, and I think it's also worth saying that, you know, when I think when a lot of reporters, like I think probably when we're talking about the tea party, we don't, at least I don't specifically mean, I won't speak for you, just the people who like actively are members of the tea party. It's just kind of like a catch all, a heuristic for like the, right. the Republican base, you know, in general. 
Um, right, and, exactly. Yeah. And, and that includes social conservatives, because if you look at all the, the polling data on who the Tea Party are, Tea Partiers are, they are often, you know, anti-abortion activists or people who have been around in the conservative movement from one stream or another for a long time, or, or even newer people, but they, but they line up with the, the kind of base pressure. Um, mm-hmm. But they've been really successful. So, wait, in, so in, let me... Oh, so let me ask you something. Let me let me ask you something for there. How much of that are you know these sort of fringe figures that you've reported on in recent years? How much of them are uh, sort of the wackier conservatives, and how much of them are just sort of a, a sub coalition of the GOP, which is I guess the more conservative members, social conservatives, uh, hardliners on fiscal policy. I mean, well, that's it's a great question because I I, th- I think the answer is maybe that there isn't an either or an or there. But that they are, the, they're sort of the same uh, people, you know. I mean, it, mm-hmm. wacky is in the eye of the beholder, um, and uh, some of these people who have been around for a long time, you know, activists, powerful on the ground. I, I, a lot of liberals would consider them wacky, um, but they are actually, you know, pretty powerful, and they represent kind of the ideological purity of um, the the right. And I think it like it, the. To answer that question, it might be best to like make the comparison with the left, which I know you wanted to get to, too. And I mm-hmm. think it's really important here because yes, there are fringes on both sides. There's there's absolutely no doubt about that. There are some really wacky people on the left. I mean, you you know, I think I would probably include a lot of like nine eleven truthers or are probably lean left, especially under the Bush administration. Um, oh yeah, you know, lots of really unsavory wacky people on the left. But there's this there's an old adage that I think is absolutely true. That uh, you know, Republicans fear their base and Democrats loathe it. So while <laughs> while Democrats keep an arm's distance from their base and kind of poo poo it, um, and they've never really given it much power or given it much ability to dictate the party's agenda, uh, the the base is where the Republican energy comes from. So it's it's much more powerful. Um, and I don't have a very good answer exactly why that is, but it's definitely true, at least in my, you know, observation, I, I'd be happy if you disagree. But, um, so I think what, what happens with the right, is it's not that they're wackier, or they're fringier. It's just that their fringier elements <clears throat> are more prominent and more powerful, um, than on the left. Mm-hmm. So I was talking with a reporter the other day, sort of related to this, and he said, uh, well, uh, two things. So he said, uh, the thing that is really conspicuous these days about outside groups and those sort of those, uh, more purist elements within either party is that when you look at, when you go and you say, you know, we are focused on electing the true conservative or the true liberal, uh, the supporters of those outside groups, like, uh, Senate Conservatives Fund or Club for Growth, they go, they go berserk. They are really up in arms about this. And it's the same with the left, which I, I want to get to in a second. Um, so there's motivation, I think, for politicians to do something. What uh, my boss, Josh Marshall, coined um, Obamacare McCarthyism, which is hmm. basically be like, you know, you it's like you don't, you may support, you may say you support repealing Obamacare or you uh, oppose it, but you haven't gone far enough. Therefore, yeah. you actually don't really oppose it. Yeah. Um, and uh, we're, like there are a few examples of this. There's uh, the Georgia Senate race. There's uh, attacks on like Mitch McConnell. Um and there's other stuff, and there are other uh, examples like this. I, I think Ted Cruz second, even during the shutdown said, "If you don't support like our defund effort, you are a supporter of Obamacare." Like, just you know, right? Yeah, right. Um, I don't like it, it, that's the the most. It's it's really it's really sort of a strange phenomenon that I see going out. And for the right, uh, it seems to be something that is really, really, like, if you can point fingers first, you sort of insulate yourself mm. from charges from the other side, and if you're on the attack there. Um, and it seems like it's those those elements you're talking about, the, the, the base elements that are doing that. Yeah. Um, and it sort of, you know, there's a hunger to sort of uh, be the most conservative right now and to push that. Um, 
it seems like there's incentive to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and on a whole host of issues, but like at the same time, uh, and just to finish this out before we go to the left, uh, like we're seeing examples right now of like there have been sort of wink, wink, nudge, nudges from like John Boehner on immigration reform and Paul Ryan and Patty Murray, uh, as I understand it, are are sort of tacitly moving toward a budget deal. So is that sort of example to an example of like the establishment, which is what the other side has been sort of labeled uh, fighting back or sort of winning, do you think? I think that that question, you know, whether the establishment is, is striking back is going to be like the, the big question of 2014. Um, it got a lot of attention, you know, in the recent weeks. I am not convinced at all. Um, you mentioned the Main Street pack, and there's a couple others. Carl Rove has said that he'll use Crossroads um, and Crossroads right. GPS to kind of do that. And um, there was another one recently started that said they raised $8 million dollars. That is interesting, but, you know, $8 million or like a couple of groups here and there is a, a penny. I mean, I think that the Koch brothers, right. you know, laugh at that. That's what they spend on breakfast every morning or, I mean, you know, <laughs> use whatever <laughs> hyperbole you choose. Um, if the establishment Republican Party were really to come back, if those big donors, you know, who have funded the party for a long time and still do, if they really wanted to make a stand, I think we would be talking – in you know hundreds of millions of dollars here, not eight million here, ten million there, but like this would be they could spend essentially unlimited amounts of money. So I haven't seen it. I think they still either see some benefit or um, are hoping that they can still kind of channel the, the Tea Party because you know it, it does work for, for if you're like a, a, a big business kind of guy and you want taxes to be lower and you want regulations to be lower. Those are your big things you are way better off with a Tea Party run Congress, even if it, it is embarrassing in all kinds of ways, like the government shuts down or whatever. That's kind of a better deal for you, especially when so many yeah. of your policies don't pull particularly well. I mean, you know, most, uh, if, if you just straight up asked, if you ran on a platform and straight up asked Americans, you know, like let's cut taxes for the rich and, and lower regulations on Wall Street, that would not particularly uh, do very well in an election. So, you know, th th this seems to be working for them. Who, maybe that might change. I don't know. And I'm very curious to see this budget deal that you just mentioned, which is apparently coming forward. It's kind of like the white whale of Washington, you know, an actual budget deal. Yeah. <laughs> um, when it comes out, so you have Paul Ryan, you know, who's tons of cred on the right. When he comes out and he's apparently, from what I've heard from my reporting, it's basically just Patty Murray and Paul Ryan um, cutting this deal. And then they're going to go out to their party and say, this is the deal. There, there hasn't been that much buy-in. And Paul Ryan has, you know, mm -hmm. if, if anyone can do it, Paul Ryan can. But I'm still very curious if, like, the Ted Cruz wing is going to go along with it and say, yes, this is fine, or at least hold their fire, even if they don't endorse it, at least just take a, uh, you know, a step back. That would be really interesting, and that would suggest that they've kind of learned the lesson of the government shutdown. But I'm not at all convinced that's I mean, going to happen. The really interesting thing about the, uh, the Paul Ryan aspect that I think it's have, has gone on unreported so far is that he's also been making uh, congressional endorsements over the past few months. And he's been endorsing hmm. some Tea Party favored candidates. And it's it's a weird way. I mean, there are a few reasons he could do that. But one way is sort of to insulate himself and to sort of seem like a coalition builder or at least someone who – both backs those candidates and then goes and talks to Democrats. Yeah. Uh, and we haven't seen that over the past few years, especially with a figure sort of like uh, as well respected within the party as Paul Ryan. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so, so it will be like, you know, how this comes out and whether sort of the, the real fire breathers on the right sort of go after Paul Ryan, uh, and Ryan is a likable, charismatic dude. It's like, it's really hard to, like, he's really young and I don't think there was too much fault uh, directed at him for uh, the GOP losing the 2012 election. Yeah. Uh, they lost in I, spite I, I of him, seems to be like the thinking. What does your gut say on a budget deal? Like, what, how, I mean, do you think that the fatigue over going over these things and a shutdown and all that stuff uh, matched with 
uh, just sort of a desire to a desire for anyone to cement a deal and put their name on something on that uh, will uh, come out with something that's not terrible. Um, here's here's my gut, and I could totally be wrong, and I will issue a mea culpa if I am. I think that Patty Murray and Paul Ryan will come out with a deal that they, they will hammer something out. Um, but I'm not very optimistic that it will, you know, pass both chambers and make it to Obama's desk. Uh, I think it's totally possible, but just, I don't know. I'm that, that's my, that's my guess. I don't know. Um, okay. yeah, I, I don't know. What, what do you think? And then I'd like, and then we should maybe move on to the, to the left, but let's get your, yeah. while, while I'm going on the record, um, let's go with, let's go with you, put you on the spot too. Yeah. I, you know, honestly, I am a little more optimistic than you. Um, I think that, I, I think that you, you can't, we've gone through so many like sort of difficult sort of, uh, processes for passing anything or getting close. And I think more than anything else, a lot of Americans like agreement and compromise deep down. Um, I don't know. I, but my gut, I mean, yeah, my gut says, Yes, it will be relatively easy and painless, but compared to the past few years, which have been pretty horrible, um, so I don't know. Um, but yeah, I wanted to segue a little bit to the left, and so while we've had, we've been seeing a GOP civil war over the last few months, in the last seven days or so, there have been something like uh, skirmishes, or maybe like, it wasn't exactly like... I guess Lexington and Concord, but sort of <laughs> like uh, disagreements between parts of the Democratic Party. Uh, the uh, some uh, top policy guys at uh, the think tank Third Way, which is sort of a vestige of uh, Bill Clinton's sort of uh, uh, centrist, or so, I don't know how you would describe it, but that sort of. Uh, third way yeah. approach to hmm. politicking uh, came out with an op-ed and they were basically criticizing uh, the economic populism of uh, uh, Elizabeth Warren, especially as it applies to Wall Street and Bill de Blasio, who are two really, really popular figures within the Democratic Party right now. Um, and so I thought a lot of the reporting on this exaggerated it a little bit. Yeah. Um, but uh, there was sort of a back and forth. Warren, you know, said some, you know, said that the slam, basically slammed uh, the op-ed and outside groups on the left, the Progressive uh, Change Campaign Committee, uh, MoveOn.org, I think, uh, a few others sort of jumped in and called for lawmakers who are affiliated with Third Way to step down if they disagreed with it. And as far as I know, uh, none of the lawmakers did that, but they didn't, they denounced the op-ed. Um, and Warren, you know, sort of strongly criticized it. Um, so a few things about this, I mean, you know, this sort of also falls in with, with recent reporting about Warren and, uh, Noam Shiver's Definitely. new Republic piece about her running for president. And, I, you know, Alex, for the life of me, like, I really don't understand. It's not that I don't understand, but like, she said so often that she's not running for president, but there seems to still be a hunger for her to do it and for her to be like the standard bearer f to apply that liberal pressure. Um, and I kind of expect we're going to see more, at least more reported conflicts going out about this, but I don't know if that's going to happen. Uh, it's definitely not on the scale of what's going on in the right, but uh, we haven't really seen a lot of infighting within the Democratic Party over the past few years, and this is sort of like a very notable sort of spot in that, yeah. I guess. Um, what do you think? Um, oh, and I think, and, and just to add one point to your excellent um, summary, Elizabeth Warren seemed to... Uh, relish this controversy and then she did something that Matt Iglesias called uh, the equivalent of legislative subtweeting, which I loved um, and she sent a letter to the chairman of all the big banks you know, J.P. Morgan um, the Wall I almost said Bear Stearns 
um, you know, Goldman Sachs. I think Bank of America. Bank of America. And, uh, yeah, there were yeah. six of them. I yeah. All I the, the, ba- basically, the six biggest banks in America, kind of shaming them to demand. This is the day after the op-ed came out, demanding that they disclose which think tanks they give money to. So essentially, she was you know mm-hmm. trying to shame them without mentioning the op-ed from Third Way. She was essentially trying to shame them or you know shake the trees and try to make some information fall about who like funded this this. Uh, campaign their way. So she was really happy for this, I think, and, and, you know, happy to be the standard bearer and to, to take it on and say, uh, like you, you know, you want to mess with me, I'm going to mess with you and, and, and come right back at it. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, in, in that Noam Schreiber piece, which I, I really enjoyed, um, the, the big, the big problem with it is whether Elizabeth Warren runs for president or not. And I would agree with you that it looks unlikely at this moment but I think he was absolutely right in to say that she captures the soul of the um, the kind of dem- liberal base of the party, um, mm-hmm. you know, and, and in a way that Hillary Clinton doesn't. I think liberals are very happy with Hillary Clinton and, and will, you know, happily vote for her when she runs for president. And I feel very comfortable saying <laughs> that. Um, but there is something, something to that. I mean, especially among younger people like my generation, our generation. Um, I know so many people, you know, who graduated and who had a tough time finding jobs, a terrible economy, and they really blamed Wall Street for that, um, you know, sympathetic to Occupy kind of uh, movement and thinking. And, and Elizabeth Warren is, is really like a shining beacon, like the one person in Washington who um, they can kind of attach their hopes and dreams to the same way Obama was in 2008. Uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, the the, the core problem here is will she run for president or not i i don't think she will um but that doesn't mean she can't cause a lot of trouble in the meantime and like i think her letter right. to the banks is a good indication of how she might go about doing that and if she were to run um you know i think it, in, in an ideal world for her she would run but not with any intention of actually you know becoming president but purely to right um put her issues on the table move hillary clinton a little bit to the left on on certain things um, and just influence in the debate in, in a very important way, which is, you know, and, and I almost hope she does run uh, just so that Clinton is not, you know, anointed um, as such. And I don't think her denials really mean anything. Obama said for a million, a million times that he would not run. And then he did. Right. Run. Yeah. You know, these things never. Well, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah. N- these things don't really mean anything. And which, which gets at one of my biggest pet peeves of, um, reporting, which I won't dwell on too long, which is that people always ask potential reporters have like very limited time with these potential candidates for president. And they always ask them if they're going to run knowing full well that the person is not going to tell you. They never say, right. They never say like, yes, on a random TV station or something. They never do that. (laughs) Yeah. But we always ask anyway. Exactly. I know it, it, it it drives me insane. Like if you're going to run for president, you're going to do a big announcement with a podium and supporters and balloons and a banner. You're not just going to casually drop it on a Tuesday, uh, you know, because some (laughs) reporter asked you, um, so, and then there's all this parsing of their language and, you know, oh, she left right. the door open. It doesn't matter. You can, you can lie. You can lie and there's no, uh, you know, retribution for it. Obama said many times he would not run. He was going to serve out his full Senate term. That was completely false and it never really, you know, was held against him. Um, but now we're getting far afield. Yeah. So, so I mean, well, w- what do you think? Like, do you think this, well, this I movement mean, is, the is real? Is, the thing that when I th- – yeah, I mean, when I think about what you're saying and sort of like the figure, so Warren is really popular with the Democratic base in sort of the same way that Ted Cruz is popular with the Republic or the conservative base. But the difference is that Cruz is much more willing to leave a presidential run open, mm. and whether or not he um, decides to do that, which I think he will, uh, it gives him more gravitas and it sort of gives him more influence to push uh, his policy positions. Mm. And Warren doesn't do that. And I wonder, really like, you know, why doesn't she, why not, maybe not disavow it so much, but why not leave the door open so she's more of a nuisance to the, the serious presidential candidates, as in the ones who want to run and want to win, like Clinton and Martin O'Malley, 
and, you know, push them on that position because it's more – like it's much easier to – rev people up and rev your base up if they think you're going to run for president. For some reason, a lot of Americans, I think, uh, don't sort of immediately recognize the value of just applying pressure for pressure's sake and sort of the the, the value of just having uh, not radicals, but people sort of pushing the extremes. And there are a lot of examples in history about this. My favorite one is sort of like the argument during during actual the Civil War, uh, where Lincoln sort of not as much of a advocate of ending slavery at the beginning, but through you know the pressure of William Seward and William Seward and Thaddeus Stevens, he sort of moved more in that direction. And like whether Warren runs or not. If you're a Democrat, I think there, and if you're a Republican, and whether Cruz runs or not, there's value in having that pressure there and having a force sort of calling attention to those ideas to avoid the anointing, like you said. Yeah. Um, I don't. I like it. It's a, for Warren, I think it's just if if she doesn't, she wants to be obviously much more delicate about this. Um, I, but you're like that letter to that banking letter was so clearly directed at third way. Yeah. Uh, just like the, it was, it wasn't, I don't, I don't even know if it was like a subtweet. It was just like <laughs> a tweet in what you mean. Um, yeah. so you, so, but you think that the coverage of that, and this will be a good way to segue into your piece, which I really want to talk about. Uh, but you think the coverage of this was sort of fair that, uh, Warren was, ready for a fight here and uh the letter sort of shows that and she's ready to throw down about this and defend uh her economic populism and her calls for tighter regulation of wall street and sort of be the standard bearer for that yeah i mean i think it was like it was overblown in some ways and and um sensationalized in a way that the media is want to do um you know probably myself mm -hmm. included uh but i think it's it's fine from a media kind of perspective, media ethics perspective, because there is a real divide there. You know, it's, it's not like they invented a divide. Um, mm -hmm. th th there, that is a really very real salient divide within the democratic base, the progressive base. Um, so, you know, I think like war analogies might be a little bit strong, but, but it, it, mm -hmm. it touched on something. It was a, you know, it was indirect. It was um, polite and, professional and you know it wasn't like she was she said much stronger things about the banks in the past but it absolutely touched on a real uh divide there and i think the media was was right to to tease that out and to you know give it some attention and um if i take off my reporter hat and put on my like progressive hat i think that's a good thing like you know i think she should be doing everything she can to uh move if she really believes what she's doing and you know if you're a progressive she should be doing everything she can to keep these issues on the table and to move the party um slightly to the left the, the question is whether she is doing it for her own self-interest or for the her ideals i think she's doing it for her ideals and, and in some sense there's not a big difference between the two since she is the best mm -hmm. conduit for these ideals um right but uh yeah, no, no. So I, I think it's I think it's fairly um, fair. Well, to close out here, I mean, I, I, it's, it's, it's also good to remember that she's not alone. Um, yeah. I don't really know where we are in this, but I know uh, a little while during uh, earlier in the year, I think there were announcements about sort of the domino effect of party chairmanships, and for the Senate Banking Committee, it was really funny because essentially there were there was a seniority list for who would take the banking committee next. And I, I think that's still up in the air. I might be wrong. Um, and it was supposed to like go to Chuck Schumer next, but he sort of signaled that seemed really unlikely. And then it was supposed to go to someone else and that seemed unlikely. So it was supposed to, so it's like sort of likely that it'll go to Sherrod Brown, yeah. who's a big populist and sort of is in that sort of wing and of the, of the democratic party in the same way. So I wouldn't, and I think from what I, what I've seen of Brown, uh, he is even, even 
uh, pricklier or more ready to sort of get in and throw down about certain things and sort of the labor issues like Warren. Yep. So I think you could see sort of a ballooning of what we're seeing on the right, uh, on the left here, especially around fiscal issues and like, and things that, point. you know, you, like you said, long, young liberals are really pissed off about. They are really unhappy. They were told, uh, you know, if we elect President Obama, we're going to have jobs and they don't, they're broke. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, there's dissatisfaction on both sides and it's, I think it's going to, Result in something else. The question is, you know, is the media going to blow this out of proportions or not? And I think a good example of whether of examining how the media covers a topic is with the rollout of the healthcare website. Nice transition. See how I made that segue? Very nice. There? Well done. You like that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you wrote a really, a really good piece, um, which and the lead was really good, which is sort of like, um, you know, Obama's in real trouble here. Uh, things aren't going well. There's this big issue going on and his administration is getting all the blame for it. And of course I'm talking about, uh, what was, it was the BP oil. Uh, it spill. wasn't, yeah, it was the BP oil spill, which I, I really remember. And it was just, you know, everyone was talking about it and everyone was like, Obama do something. And you cited examples after that of like, other areas where Obama, where this was going to be Obama's Alamo, Obama's uh, Katrina moment, um, Obama's big, big sort of downfall in one episode. And it's not even like my take from your piece is that it, it wasn't even that it didn't turn out to be that. It was sort of that just the passage of time and sort of the 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 coverage and sort of the the uh, uh, sort of perspective was lost in these moments yeah. of crisis. Yeah, I think um, I, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, in the middle of one of these firestorms, like if you go back to um, mid-November, I think the 17th was the date that the House voted on Fred Upton's bill, which was like the uh, Republican, you know, people can keep their coverage bill. That was that's where I would kind of mark the the peak of the, the media firestorm around the healthcare.gov website, and in the middle of it, it absolutely looked like like Obama's done. He's like, what can he possibly do? You know, it's just wall to wall coverage on cable news. Every single almost um, news story online is about it. Democrats are jumping ship, and you know everybody's mind has a tendency to extrapolate things linearly going forward. So it's really bad now. It, I don't see a way that it's going to fix, so it's just going to get worse. And that's that's just a, a kind of cognitive bias that we all have, including people in the media. And they tend to lose sight of um, history or realize that things change, which is a, a kind of astonishing. Um, <laughs> so they just assume that it's going to get worse and worse and worse and that Obama, you know, will never recover. And it's just, I, I mean, I, all I, you know, w one of the things that I did to report that, quote, report it using next nexus reporting which is one of my favorite kinds of reporting is i just punched in you know can obama recover question mark in quotes and got <laughs> dozens hundreds of of stories going back to 2007 you know reverend wright uh comes out can obama recover yeah uh henry lewis gates arrest and obama calls it stupid this is the beer summit thing can obama <laughs> recover bp oil spill can obama recover hurricane sandy can obama recover um, you know, I'm forgetting like a half a dozen of them, but there, I there are so many. I remember right when Obama jumped into the race and he called like Hillary Clinton Bush Cheney light. And my friend was like, Obama is done. <laughs> you know, it was over. And it was this tiny or like, or even like, remember when Joe Biden called uh, Obama, like, what was it? It was clean or neat oh yeah or something articulate and something then like that, at yeah. the time if you had told any political analyst like oh and by the way joe biden's going to be his vp they would be like no that's ridiculous yeah. did you hear what he just said it's insane what about your um, gaps obama yeah what about your gaps yeah but i i mean my question going away well my question is twofold about this one thing is that um so last week I went to uh, the American Legislative Exchange Council 
uh, they had this event in D.C. and uh, one, and Ted Cruz spoke. And one thing he said there, which really surprised me, was that he said eventually they'll figure out this healthcare website thing. But that's not why we should oppose Obamacare anyway. We should oppose it because it's a bad law. Mm. That's what he said. Um, that surprised me because aren't you know aren't we supposed to be saying right now that the doom and gloom, like the fact that the healthcare dot gov website the rollout was terrible and there are a lot of kinks in it right now isn't that supposed to mark like why would you say that if you're a conservative um but he did say that yeah it's interesting and eric erickson it doesn't seem like yeah. some right and so you have these big influential figures in the gop saying this but you don't have a lot of the media s sort of framing that in the forgive me for saying for using the uh, word narrative here, but you don't have that. Yeah. Uh, why don't you? Why don't we see that, Alex? I mean, is it just sort of the excitement of the moment? Yeah. Or I mean, and 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 to be fair, also like unlike the other disasters, this is Obama's signature thing. This is the the thing that he promised the American people. Right. You know, he said this is going to change everything. He told red state Democrats, "Listen, you got to back me on this." Uh, I, you know, you just have to stick with me on this. We've got your back here, but you got to go with me here. And as far as I can tell, most of the red state Dems up for reelection were planning on doing that. They were not planning on, you know, saying that the, oh, the healthcare website had problems. Right. Um, so I like, where do you think the disconnect is? Well, I, I think it's a few things. Um, and I'll try to remember all of them as you were talking that you just going to say. The first, yeah, let's let's get out the get out of the way. The the to be sure, the caveat. I mean, this was a big mess up. I, I would use a different word if if uh, if I could. I don't know if I can on blogging heads, but you know, it starts with an F, and you know the word. This is a, a, a huge I, yeah. fiasco. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's there's no doubt about that. I mean, th this was you know, and, and if you're a liberal, I think you should absolutely be furious at the president for doing this. Like you got this is the most important progressive accomplishment in generations, something that seven presidents have tried to do. You finally got it. You made it through the House, you made it through the Senate, you made it through Scott Brown's election when it looked like it was doomed. You made it through the Supreme Court when it looked like it was doomed. And then, you know, on the on the final yard, when the ball is entirely in your control, you just fumble it, like a completely unforced error to mix my sports metaphors. Um that's, you know, that's unforgivable. That is, that is really inexcusable. Like this was entirely in your control and you messed it up and potentially jeopardized the most important progressive accomplishment in generations. But if you're the, the, but the, the thing is you can fix it, right? You know, like you can come back in two months and you can fix the website and you know, you should still be like, we still need to have a hard conversation about what happened here and make sure that doesn't happen again and fix it. But I think what the media, um, I think they're just eager for a scandal. There's this Brendan Nyan, a political scientist at Dartmouth who studies the media, uh, is one of my favorite academics. And he's written a lot about scandals and how scandals become a thing. And he has uh, found that in the second term of presidents is when scandals become a thing, that the election is over. You need, a, you know, kind of a new storyline. And in order for a scandal to... Um, you know, reach scandal proportions in order to go from a controversy to a scandal, you need to have the opposition party and the media both in having interests pointing in the same direction. It's not that they're colluding. It's that they both have, you know, self-interest that point in the same direction. So Republicans always have an interest in, you know, ginning up scandal. But in a second term, when there's not much else going on, the media does. And I think they especially do at a time, you know, after spending all of October just absolutely annihilating Republicans for the government shutdown and, you know, mainstream reporters just c completely pooping all over Republicans. I think they like to have a balance of now we can attack, uh, the president. And, you know, I, I think that you could, we could also get into, I think there's a, a media bias thing here in that conservatives are right. That most reporters are liberal, like with, you know, without a doubt, most people who work on TV, cable news, objective reporters are, are liberal. They live in urban environments. they, you know, mm -hmm. went to many have graduate degrees. If you just look at their demographics, they are, they are liberal. So I think, but they, but they take their jobs very seriously. They don't want to be biased. They, they want to do be independent journalists. So I think there's sometimes a tendency to be more 
um, sympathetic to, to Republican ideas and, and they, and they're looking for opportunities to attack a democratic president because it can show, show that they are objective and they're independent. Look, like we can be just as hard on Obama as we were on Bush because the media is very hard on Bush. Mm-hmm. So I think there's a, there's a, they're prime there, but then just in general, there's always going to be an interest. If you're a columnist or, you know, a pundit, there's always an interest in having a strong statement. No one's interested in, well, the website is not good, but maybe it right. would be fixed, blah, blah, blah. No, like Obama is over. This is a disaster. That's way more interesting, you know, and I can see it in what I write. And mm-hmm. if I write something with a very strong point of view, it, it does better in traffic. And then my editors like me more and then that's good for me. So I have a, you know, I'm conditioned to keep doing right. that. Um, so I think there's always going to be some of that, no matter what, and that's fine. And, you know, uh, the, 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 the one problem going forward is, and this happened with the IRS scandal, and I think we're going to see the same thing happening with this scandal. There's always a ton of coverage of the scandal itself. You know, oh, it's terrible, it's terrible. But then once it kind of works its way out, and once the IRS scandal, quote unquote, was revealed to not really be that big of a deal at all, you know, the, it actually wasn't Watergate. It wasn't the IRS targeting Tea Party groups. We, we learned that later on. There's very little coverage cleaning up the mess because it's it's way less interesting and it's kind of embarrassing. You know, you have to kind of admit you're wrong. And I think that's going to be the same thing that's going to happen here. All the pundits who were, you know, doom and gloom um, about the healthcare website are not going to come back and say, oh, the website's fixed, like, well done. And I've been, you know, keeping track of uh, the metrics just in like Nexus and TV mentions, and it's already gone way down. So what happens is it just kind of fades into the rear view mirror and there's never an accounting of um, what the media went wrong, what right. got wrong. So, so it sounds like you're one of these reporters who really would like to see, uh, like, highlighting – uh, columnists and pundits who just got something insanely wrong. Like the analysis was so off and, uh, you know, the columnist or the pundit to say, yeah, I was completely wrong. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't, I, I get that. Um, I don't, I, I think as a, you know, for columnists, I'm not a columnist, but like, there's a fear that you instant like your credibility is a one time thing, and if you say you're wrong on something, um, but the pundits that I like a lot on the right and the left, every once in a while they'll say, "I just got it wrong," and you know it turned out that's how uh, events work. You know that's news. Yeah, uh, but I wanted to ask you one other thing about sort of the coverage of the rollout. Um, you know what the the thing that. The, the even the really legitimate claim I think uh, is really not you know the website being or the the legitimate ongoing criticism is really not the website it is to me and please call me out on this here it's you know the Obama's uh, you know promise and the John Kerry promise if you like your plan you can keep mm. it uh, thing and it's you know we have a reporter who uh, focuses it right now is focusing on uh, Obamacare almost full time. And, you know, he said that the, you know, this was, there was going to be something like this. Like there were going to be some insurance plans that people like that didn't adhere to the law, yeah. but generally, so this law could work, they would have to drop. Yeah. Um, and this law, and to be fair, this law is huge. It's really technical and it's really hard to understand. It's really complex. Uh, but you know, like, and I remember a great ProPublica story on an example of this, of a, a family of two that had a plan they really liked and it was really good for them and they had to drop it. They lost it because of Obamacare. Uh, do you think there's been proportional coverage, A, of like that fact and B, like, I mean, because we haven't seen that as much as like the healthcare website is terrible, which right. is a much easier headline to write. Um, but do you think the coverage of that has been fair and that the criticism of that yeah. uh, has been fair, uh, I, you know, yeah. is right. No. And then there has been some coverage of that. I mean, and there were legislative fixes proposed, you know, the Upton bill was to address that. Um, but yeah, you're right. Like, I mean, I feel, pr- I almost never accuse politicians of lying because you, it, it, you don't know what, what's going on in their head. Um, you know, mm-hmm. Although I realized I accused Obama of lying earlier in this segment when he said he wasn't going to run for president. Maybe that, that could have been wrong because maybe he <laughs> honestly thought he wasn't going to run for president and then he changed his mind. 
So I'll attract the, right. my lie accusation there and now redeploy it um, on the White House and Obama. And I think with this, you, if you like your coverage, you can keep it. I think that was pretty much a, a lie, plain and simple. I think they knew that people, some people, a minority, a small minority of people were going to lose their plans um, and we're going to have to buy new plans. And they said it anyway because the, the true statement, which Obama has started saying now, is much less bumper stickerable. Um, you know, like if you get your coverage through an employer or through the government or through several other options and you like your plan, then you can keep it. But if you are on the individual market and you have a substandard plan and, you know, blah, 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 then maybe you won't be able to keep it. It's just like, you know. Yeah. Like for for something something like ninety seven percent of cases, I think it, it was correct. But but they but they right in draw on a hard line. I think it's false. I, I don't think it's that big of a deal. I mean, you know, politicians lie. That's it's a job requirement. And if you compare it to like what Republicans have said about the Affordable Care Act, from like death panels to socialized medicine to government takeover of healthcare, you know, it's a it's a pretty small one. Um, but yeah, it is a lie. And I think the media is right to, to take the administration to tax for that. I, it, I find it hard to get up in arms about something that's 97% true. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean, it was a lie. It, it's just a, a fairly white lie in, in the scheme of things. So to close out today, Alex, uh, cause we're over, uh, this is longer than what I pitched for this, this blogging heads episode. Uh, you know, I, I, I wanted to go back to, you know, the incentives to sort of inflate or to, uh, as a reporter, uh, or not, you know, just in general, the journalism industry to make a big deal about something. And it's really hard, I think, because we're in this sort of like hyper sensational sort of period of journalism where there's so much content produced each day. And it's so fast to get attention. You need to have, it can't just be, you know, there are some problems with the healthcare.gov website. Right. And, you know, there are some problems. It's not that bad. It's sort of bad. I don't know. It, I'm like, because you're competing with other outlets and other sharp reporters and the, the time demands are so great. I'm semi-sympathetic like you to that, but like, I, I think it's important to, and and you 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 hit on this, uh, but it's like an important fact that we're looking at. As if you're a consumer of news, you kind of need to take a lot of things with a grain of salt. There are a lot. There are publications, I'm sure you know as well, uh, that like to exaggerate things and make a bigger deal about them, uh, and have a habit of doing that. Partially because it's you know, as a reader, it's more exciting to read that. It's it's like going to an action movie. It's more exciting yeah. to see explosions and stuff and sort of like a chase than or like the prospect of something. Yep. No, it's true. I mean, yeah. So how do we move forward? How do we be better? Is, is yeah. Different? How do we? Yeah. How do you do? You said you said you know this. It seems like this is here to stay. So with everything, with the civil war, with uh, on the on the left and the right, with the uh, coverage of uh, the Affordable Care Act, running for president, lies and the lying liars who tell them. <laughs> Uh, are we going to see that go away? Is it going to be, I mean, cause we've sort of like, I think we're definitely in the age of Twitter where like when something gets picked up, it gets picked up, but when it doesn't and you know, sort of things dissolve very quickly, uh, is that going to disappear? So, uh, I, I will tr <laughs> try this back on you too. Cause that's a tough, it's a good question. I don't think okay. I don't think it will. I don't think it will disappear. Um, here's my yeah. gut and, uh, uh, I don't think the the media angle, the media part of it, will disappear. There, that interest will always be there. I think it always has been there. I would just like to see a little bit of accountability, and I'll and I'll give some props to Chris Saliza at the Washington Post, who I also complimented on Twitter several times. He uh, said he had written a column a while ago, like in Jan in July, that the nuclear option would never happen. He said it would it'll never come to pass. And then after it did come to pass, you know, last week or two weeks ago. He wrote a column saying, I got this wrong. Like I, you know, and here's why I got it wrong and I'll, and, and why not? And I thought that was really, really impressive and, um, mm -hmm. cool. And I, I think that's awesome. And I, you know, I get stuff wrong. I've and look at him. He's still employed. And he's still employed. Exactly. You know, and if, and if any, my stock of, he's gone up 
tremendously in, in my book. So I would just like to see a little <laughs> bit more of that. You know, it's transparency, essentially. Um, so I'm cautiously optimistic. I, yeah, I, I definitely... I definitely, I'm convinced, and I hadn't really sort of heard a good explanation until now about why, like, the in, the reasons we should have, I mean, it's not even that, you know, pundits should just say they're wrong because they're wrong, but, like, you sort of, they seem more human, mm. and it doesn't seem, like, I, I'm, I'm still gonna, if there's a columnist or pundit I, who said, you know, this Obamacare rollout shows that the law is terrible, and, uh, you know, it turns out not to be so bad or, you know, uh, Elizabeth Warren will never run for president and she turns out too. And then they go back and say, yeah, I mean, this is the information I had at the time and this is what I went with and I was wrong and, you know, I was wrong, but this is what's happening now. I, yeah, they'll, their stock will go up in my book too. Yeah. I mean, like there's, I'm not going to boycott them because they were wrong once because I am wrong all the time um and we're all humans yeah you know yeah so um okay alex that's uh all i've got uh thank you so much for doing this with me uh this is a real pleasure um yeah this is fun you know and it's yeah so uh i i I think i'm gonna see you like soon at some social event (laughs) so um i will talk to you then sounds good thanks for doing this all right yeah thanks for doing this all right bye. bye